going to discuss the difference between natural phenomenon and social phenomenon, an idea, a big idea, Mr. Soros, that has really guided you through life. Well, it's my pleasure. It's a, uh, uh, basically something that I developed uh, as a student days, and it has really kind of guided me uh, both in uh, making money and in spending money. <laughs> now tell us the the basics and exactly when you thought of it. Was there a special moment where you thought actually this is what what you know our society is about? No, uh, as a student, I was studying economics, and at the same time, I was reading Karl Popper, the philosopher, and uh, studying uh, ba uh, you know basic economics, theory of perfect competition which originally assumed perfect knowledge. And then I was reading uh, Popper, who made it clear that uh, uh, perfect knowledge is unattainable, that uh, even, uh, even in science uh, you can't, be, you can't uh, um, uh, validate uh, theories, you can also, uh, only falsify them. So the two ideas were directly uh, uh, contradictory. And I sided with Popper. Uh, and so uh, also, you know, economics was rather using a lot of math, and I was not very good at math. So I rather <laughs> questioned the assumptions on which the math was ba based. And, and that's how I came to this uh, recognition that economics w uh, ignored this fundamental difference. Uh, between natural phenomena and social phenomena, ph phenomena, because in natural phenomena, uh, the imperfect understanding, uh, uh, which which is uh, is part of human nature, uh, uh, unavoidable, uh, uh, doesn't enter in, into the the sequence of events that you are studying. So you can actually establish uh, universally valid laws which can be used both to, uh, to um, predict and to explain. Uh, and it's a, actually a, a, fa a really beautiful uh, construction, uh, natural science. Uh, in social phenomena, this doesn't work because uh, the imperfect understanding enters into the sequence of events, and it introduces an element of uncertainty that's uh, actually absent in natural uh, phenomena. Uh, you also have uncertainty principle in, in physics, uh, uh, but this human uncertainty principle is an additional uh, source of uh, uncertainty. So when uh, Heisenberg discovered the, the, uh, the uncertainty principle, it didn't change the behavior of the uh, quanta uh, that uh, it was referring to. Uh, whereas in, when you uh, discover a, a, a theory about social affairs, it actually it can change society. So when, let's say, uh, Karl Marx uh, proposed his theory of history, it actually changed his history. You, this is an idea, a big idea, that didn't yeah. get much traction at the beginning, but you felt vindicated in 2008. Yeah, right. I mean, this, uh, I developed this, uh, I uh, actually published it first in 1987, The Alchemy of Finance. And I called it alchemy uh, to indicate uh, that uh, uh, it's not uh, it doesn't uh, uh, cl uh, claim to be a scientific explanation of uh, of phenomena of uh, of financial markets, uh, but it's a better explanation than the scientific one, which which ignored this fundamental difference. So uh, you know, uh, um, uh, 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 the alchemists uh, made a, 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 a big mistake when they tried to change the behavior of uh, uh, metals 
by abracadabra. Uh, they should have gone into the financial markets because the, <laughs> there you actually can change uh, the, the sequence of events uh, by abracadabra. <laughs> so, so what <laughs> lessons have we learned actually from the crisis? Well, so then uh, 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 the uh, let's say my interpretation of financial markets, which I put forward in '87, was basically ignored. It was recognized or studied in uh, in uh, business schools, but academic economists uh, uh, either uh, I mean they basically ignored it. Uh, uh, but then, with the financial crisis, which uh, uh, got serious in August 2007, but I actually pretty well predicted it at Davos in January uh, uh, 87, and then uh, culminated in the uh, uh, bankruptcy of the Lehman Brothers. Uh, that really shook the existing uh, efficient market hypothesis rational expectations uh, a, a theory, because it did not actually allow for that to happen. So um, uh, that, that's when uh, this, uh, uh, my construction, which is sort of built on two pillars of fallibility and reflexivity, uh, and then it gained uh, traction. And that was really when it, 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 one could really start uh, um, have, having public discussions about it. Until then, I, I developed it pretty well on my own because it wasn't seriously uh, discussed. So it, it really requires a lot more development uh, than it has had so far. And uh, actually, I also uh, uh, established or founded the Institute for New Economic Thinking which uh, uh, is not actually uh, devoted to reflexivity as such, but where, where within which you know you can also discuss reflexivity. What does it mean for the future? What is your your big prediction for the next two to three years? Are we in a phase where it's very easy to come back to what happened to two thousand and eight because we're in such a fragile state? Well, I mean the the, the unfortunate fact is that the, the established um, uh, theory has collapsed, but we haven't actually uh, got a proper understanding how financial markets operate. And, and we have introduced uh, synthetic uh, instruments, invented, uh, you know, uh, derivatives, and, uh, where we don't, we, are not, we don't fully understand uh, the effect uh, they have. And the concept of equilibrium, which was basically borrowed from, from Newtonian physics, is not applicable uh, to financial markets because they are actually, uh, um, it's not that equilibrium is impossible, but it's, a, it's an extreme that actually actually is not attained you can you can be okay, sometimes close to equilibrium but at other times you are very far from equilibrium with no particular tendency to return to equilibrium and we are actually since 2008 in this far from equilibrium territory because when financial markets collapsed, uh, uh, and they really actually did, uh, and the, the authorities had to intervene to, to actually keep it on what I call artificial respiration. And the artificial respiration was, uh, was uh, to uh, substitute the credit of the state, uh, sovereign credit, for the financial credit that uh, collapsed. And that meant a s sort of a del delicate uh, two-phase maneuver where you actually had to I I inject additional credit uh, in a situation uh, which was 
uh, a crisis situation which was brought about by too much leverage and too much credit. You actually had to add more uh, uh, in order to uh, uh, correct the situation, to bring it under control. So when, uh, when a car is skidding, you first have to turn the wheel in the same direction as the skid uh, to regain control, because if you don't, then you have the car rolling over. Uh, so you first regain control, and then you correct the direction. So that's what the authorities did. Uh, that was actually something that they learned from the previous occasion in the 1930s, when not doing this, when trying to balance uh, the, the budget uh, um, when, uh, when you had insufficient demand, actually created a depression. So this was the lesson, a quantitative easing, uh, let's say pioneered by Bernanke, um, uh, is, let's say, the, the lesson learned from the 1930s. But what is the car doing at the well, moment? And are, now we, are we driving? You, uh, pan, in, what is the car doing? Are we, we're not in, in a forward well, we, trajectory we, yet. We, we, the we, first phase of the maneuver is, <laughs> is pretty well complete. But the second phase, we haven't yet started. Uh, and uh, uh, you, now, uh, you, you now had the euro crisis, which actually has preoccupied me for the last year or so, because uh, there, uh, the, this uh, emphasis put on uh, the, uh, or the injection of a sovereign credit revealed a flaw in the construction of the euro, a fundamental flaw uh, that uh, the authorities themselves uh, didn't realize uh, because uh, the, uh, the um, government debt of the, of the member countries is designated in a currency which they don't control. Mm. So they, are, they, are, they actually have a, a, a debt in a foreign currency, uh, similar to uh, the, uh, the uh, less developed uh, countries, the, de uh, the developing world, that, w that uh, got over indebted in uh, dollars or uh, uh, yen or whatever, uh, you know, there's a foreign currency. And so uh, that, uh, that added a, a, a risk that was unrecognized, uh, credit risk, namely the danger of, uh, of uh, default. Because uh, uh, if you uh, issue that in your own currency, you have absolutely no reason to default because you can always print it, right? But you, uh, the member countries couldn't print, print uh, euros, so they could default. And therefore, uh, suddenly, when the markets realized this, and they were rather slow in realizing it, uh, uh, they put on a tremendous uh, a risk premium. Are, are we now in danger of having a credit bubble because of all of this cheap the, liquidity? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, this is the big issue, the unresolved issue. Uh, um, it, I think in, it, it, it should be possible to um, withdraw the, the additional credit as, uh, as, uh, as the economy gets going. But it hasn't been done yet, and therefore there's a fear uh, that uh, this could result in a runaway inflation. Uh, this is the fear that uh, prevails uh, particularly in Germany. So uh, uh, Germany and the, and the Eurozone, because it's, it's dominated by Germany, uh, is uh, out of tune with the rest of the world. Um, uh, so even though the financial, uh, even though the Euro crisis has, has been sort of uh, brought under control in 2013, uh, 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 this, uh, 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 let's say, uh, a disagreement on how to handle 
the recession uh, actually remains very acute. And it, it has become more acute uh, this year than it has been before because uh, uh, the last holdout in the rest of the world, namely Japan, uh, has, has uh, uh, changed course at the beginning of this year. But how difficult is it for central banks to decide when they have to mop up this liquidity? Yeah, that's, it, it, it is for the, this is a, a maneuver that has to be carried out uh, by the central banks. But it's difficult to decide the moment where, the, the ideal moment to do this, that's, is it not? It, it's probably impossible uh, to do it. And uh, it's going to be a, a, a tricky thing. And uh, in fact, most likely, if the e economy actually gathers momentum and, and the, in, uh, the money injected into the system uh, uh, gathers momentum, um, uh, interest rates will shoot up and uh, arrest the recovery. So we are facing, I think, a, a period of uh, stop uh, of uh, uh, go stop, uh, which is far superior to no go at all. Um, you said at the beginning that your big idea helped you decide how to make money, but also how to spend money. Right. Can you give us concrete examples? Well, uh, um, yes. Uh, I mean, the, for instance, when. Um, I set up a foundation in uh, in the United States uh, because you know the foundation is is uh, uh, devoted to promoting open society, which is an idea that I absorbed, I took over uh, from uh, uh, Karl Popper. Now the first thing is that actually I discovered that the concept of open society, which guided me in um, uh, setting up, uh, in getting involved in the Soviet, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, is also flawed. So when I applied the theory, I discovered actually it has a flaw in it. Uh, so that's one e example of uh, 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 recognizing uh, the pervasive influence of misconceptions in shaping the course of history. So uh, the, the, the idea which is guiding me also has a, has a flaw in it. So that's one <laughs> example. Then uh, when uh, things in, uh, uh, the, in this Soviet, uh, former Soviet Union kind of calmed down, the revolution kind of uh, 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 abated, uh, then I, I wanted to address the uh, deficiencies of the what I consider to be one of the most uh, developed uh, and successful open societies, the United States. And so I set up a foundation in uh, active in America. And two of the the first issues that we addressed were issues that uh, were basically insoluble problems where the, uh, the way of dealing with the, with the insoluble problems made the problems worse than they need to be. Uh, and one, one of these problems actually is death. It's rather you know, unavoid unavoidable <laughs> and, and it's, it's, it's actually quite unacceptable to our consciousness, because it's the, the demise of our consciousness. So it's an anathema to, to our thinking. Uh, and so we invent all kinds of uh, myths and things to, to sort of make it acceptable, uh, what basically is unacceptable. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, and in, in the case of uh, the United States, America, it's really there's a cult of uh, denying death, not accepting uh, it. 
and, uh, uh, and that in many ways makes the process of dying uh, uh, much more painful. Um, and if, uh, if you don't accept it beforehand, fun? if you don't accept it beforehand, th that, yeah. that, 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 there comes a point where you, I mean you have to accept eventually uh, uh, give up the struggle uh, uh, and <laughs> just uh, 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 accept it. Um, and uh, uh, that project, I think, m made a lot of impact, uh, particularly in the medical profession. Mm -hmm which also denied death. So for instance, dying is, is not accepted as, a, as, a, as a, uh, something that has to, has to be uh, dealt, or it was not accepted, uh, as, a, uh, uh, as a subject for, uh, for, insur for medical reimbursement. Uh, so, uh, um, and of course, uh, uh, doctors, and, and nurses were uh, trained uh, to, f to fight it uh, beyond uh, any, uh, uh, so uh, not to, uh, not to ex accept it properly. So uh, thinking has, has really uh, changed. And also, I think uh, public opinion has also uh, shifted a bit uh, in, in that respect. Um, Mr. Soros, I think we're about to wrap yeah. up. I just want to get one last uh, thought from you. Yeah. Do you believe that everything is fallible? Hmm? Do you believe that everything is, can, has a flaw? And, uh, and is this what we have to take away from your big idea? Y yes. Uh, I, I mean, it's a very good, uh, let's say, uh, practical uh, assumption, a working assumption, to assume uh, uh, or to recognize that uh, that your uh, way of uh, thinking and acting uh, may be flawed, and is and and in fact, uh, inevitably, if you actually have uh, something that works, you will overburden it, uh, put too much weight on it until it becomes. Uh, uh, flawed. So you even, uh, uh, let's say, natural science, which actually does produce fantastic results, has been overburdened by applying the methods and criteria to the study of, of uh, uh, social uh, phenomena. So what works in the, in the field of natural phenomena uh, can actually be misleading in applying those methods to the uh, uh, social phenomena. So uh, th that is a very good example of uh, a, a true idea uh, uh, getting overburdened uh, and, and until it becomes misleading. And, and central bankers, policy makers, and governments need to understand this to avoid the next crisis. That, that is, and it's very hard to to um, to come to terms with it. With it. Um, and of course, uh, particularly institutions, governments uh, hang on uh, to their mistakes. And the euro crisis is the perfect example because it's very largely self-inflicted, because having made a uh, an original error, uh, it hasn't been uh, actually admitted, recognized, and corrected. Mr. Soros, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.